Um, just to start off, generally, what's, what's your own thoughts on the property market? You know, as a surveyor, you, you must see, you see it every day. What, you know, where are we at? You know, now we've had the recession and people say there's green shoots and we're, we've got this growth supposedly this morning in the television. What, what, what's it looking like? From a property perspective, it is, it is more positive now than it's been for quite a long time. There's no doubt about that. Um, in, a, in a way, you, you stole my thunder there by, by letting everybody know that London's doing well and we're not. Um, and that's the big headline that we all hear. You know, we all hear about how, how wonderful, how, how quick the, the growth is, is happening in London and, and in the South East. And, and it, it does put all the statistics um, completely wrong because most of the regions aren't doing well. But from a property perspective, returns are better now than they've been for a number of years. Mm -hmm. The third quarter of, of 2013 has been resoundingly positive, I think, from a property point of view. Returns are better. There's more people starting up. Um, where there were formerly doubts about tenants' ability to pay rent, ah, right. that's now more certain again. And so... Uh, the landlords are a bit more comfortable, a bit more positive, and so in turn they can kind of pass that sentiment back to to their funding um, people, who, whether that's the bank or, or, or shareholders or whatever. So there's there's definitely an, an uplift in confidence at the moment. Mm -hmm. And it, you, you just mentioned funding there. Is there also a bit, is this government freeing up you know, via the bank? Supposedly we hear conflicting stories. The bank, some of the banks say, oh, we've got plenty of money to lend. Nobody's asking, and then other businesses say, "Oh, well, no one will give us the money." Is mm. is there a, a do you get a sense of it freeing up in the property market? Yeah, a, li a little bit. I don't want to overstate that because it would be wrong to think that all of a sudden the banks have got their doors wide open and that, that and that you can get the lending terms that you want. The banks have always had their doors open, but their terms were very hard to swallow for, for anybody that wanted to, to go and get a, a project funded. Mm -hmm. And I sense that it's, it's those terms that have eased up a bit okay. um, and they're a bit more commercial. That, uh, the banks, in my, in, from my point of view, the banks are also affected by public sentiment. And so whilst there has been a general mood of pessimism, the banks have, have shared that and, and they felt that they have to, they have to also present that pessimistic face and protective face towards yeah. their customers you know they're they're not going to say you know everybody else is 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 is, is having a hard time but you know we feel great so our terms can, will, will be free and easy they've had to they've had not to say that but now because there's a general pickup in sentiment a bit more positivity about it. i think the banks obviously feel that it's it's time for them too to to show a little bit more leniency in, in the terms they okay. offer so with that in mind, if let's say we've got, business, we've got business owners in the room today and we've got them VCing in, and if somebody is a business owner or maybe has, has got some money and they want to develop commercial property and the bank is saying, yeah, we'll lend, you know, do you think they should do that? Or do you think maybe they should still hedge their bets and maybe let some property, you know, rent it mm. rather than buy it? You know, what, what would the pros and cons be there? Well, of course, circumstances for every every business are different, and 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 their, their access to funds. <coughs> and um, I think what you're getting at is is the underlying thing that property is property something to invest in. If you invest in property, will that in in five years or ten years time, looking back, will that have been a good idea or not? And I think and. As a general rule, it will have been a good idea because over the long term, and that's what we're talking about, property has always performed relatively well, mm -hmm. um, both in the domestic market and in the commercial markets. Um, if you look back, property was worth less in the past. It will be worth more in the future. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you're if you able to, to look that far ahead, mm -hmm. and, and that's a big question that we can maybe come on to, uh -huh. but if you can look that far ahead, then, uh, then yeah, if you, if you can get the funds on terms that you can afford, then I think you should buy. Hmm. And just in terms of you know, the letting scenario, you, sometimes you hear people saying, oh, it's cheaper to buy than to let, you know, pay the rent, it's cheaper to get a mortgage. I mean, is, is, is that starting to be the case again? Or is it still, you know, how, how would you feel, in, I mean, looking at the Highlands and Islands, again, is that something that, that people weigh up as well? I think it is something that people weigh up. I think there are, there are, there are it's, it's usually not just a simple question of this 
sum and this sum of money, but there are other op there are other issues about renting mm -hmm. or buying mm -hmm. that, that come into that question too. It, it's it's whether you want the the um, the flexibility to to maybe move from one property to another mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a short space of time. That's what I was alluding to a few minutes ago when I was talking about how far ahead you can predict. Ah, right. Because for many businesses and many property owners generally, domestic and commercial, they, they don't really know what their needs are going to be in, in 10 years' time. Uh -huh. And if that's a big issue for you, then you have to think again about how wise is the decision to invest all your money in it. Mm -hmm. Of course, I suppose, yes, there is also the... The, you know, in terms of loan to value, you'll be asked to put down a deposit. So I suppose there is that as well, that you'll be looking at putting all your cash or a substantial amount of cash yeah. in as a deposit, which you might be able to use elsewhere. Well, that's right. That, that, and again, as I mentioned, the fact that everybody's circumstances are different. And for lots of businesses, if they have a chunk of cash, there will be lots of calls in that. Um, mm -hmm. Putting it into your property is only one, but I'm sure there's plenty of other places where you could wisely use that capital. So if you're at the stage where you you think right, well, either buying or letting, and or if you're new to this, you know you're set, you've got a business, you've been doing it, say in your garage or your back room, and you're going into the property market for the first time. What kind of checklist? You know, what are the main things you'd have in the checklist if it's commercial property? Mm. Well, I guess I mean the, the the size and the suitability of the space is 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 the kind of thing that is obvious to to most people, but not to everybody. We get inquiries from people sometimes that 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 illustrate that they really haven't got a clue how much property they need. Um, but but you've, got to, you've got to narrow down, you've got to take advice if you need it as to just how much space you need. And can you get that space um, ready for your use or do you have to, are you going to have to spend more money fitting it out once you've taken a lease mm -hmm. or once you've bought it? Um, you've got to think about, um, if it's a lease in particular, you've got to look quite carefully at the lease terms in terms of what flexibility you have to to, um, to sublet it, or all of it, or part of it, if you need to. Mm -hmm. You need to look closely at your repairing covenant. How, what obligation are you taking on to, to spend money on, on the fabric? So well, that could be down to the tenant? Uh, in all probability it will, yes. Ah, okay. But uh, you need to take advice, you need to, to drill into the detail of the, of the, of the lease. Uh, in Scotland, unlike in England, there, there is no kind of statutory backup to your position as a tenant. Uh, mm -hmm. If it says something in the lease, then that's what you have to do. Ah, um, okay. And that's the big difference between Scottish and English property law. Okay. So at all these stages, taking advice is, is critical and, and we're quite often surprised by how little advice people take. Sometimes people go into things thinking it'll be fine and ah. quite often it isn't fine. <laughs> you know, another classic in that respect is, is um, people sign up to leases um, with a, a repairing liability and, and the lease expires and then the landlord comes back and says, oh, by the way, you've got to put the property back into fantastic condition so that I can relate it again. And the poor tenant thinks, well, it's just there's a bit of wear and tear in the carpet and the walls are a wee bit grubby, but I didn't really do that. Uh -huh. If you've had a schedule of condition done at the start, you'll know exactly where you stand. But so many tenants going into a commercial property lease don't have a schedule of condition done and so they're exposed as a result. Mm -hmm. So it's something we're seeing a bit more awareness of as time passes, but but there is still a lot of um, a lot of naivety out there about uh, about just what you're signing up to. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, it's I think the message is coming through loud and clear that it's take advice. <laughs> you're frightening me already, you know. <laughs> but um, and and I, and I suppose even large companies get caught out when, when you're talking about between Scotland and England. I would imagine you mm -hmm. get people who have you have built up a huge chain of ah. businesses in England and all of a sudden come to Scotland and then find themselves and don't realise that it's that it's a different scenario. Yes, uh, we, absolutely, yes, indeed. We, I remember having to do a schedule of condition for, uh, at the end of a lease, for somebody at a unit in Eastgate Centre and they, they obviously didn't really have a clue about what they'd, they'd let themselves in for until the lease expired and they had a, a nasty schedule of dilapidations that they had to, they had to deal with. Had to fix. Hmm. So, um, yeah, um, be aware. It is is a strong message that uh, mm -hmm. um, everybody should be should be aware of. Moving on to you know another hot topic, um, certainly in Inverness, that we hear in the university because we we have to house students who come to the area, and there's a lot of talk of buy to lets and should you know, people invest in buy to lets. I mean, so if we got a scenario, for example, you see Mr. And Mrs. Jones, for example, and they they either inherit a house 
<laughs> from their parents if they uh, or or they've got some money and they're considering buy to let. Do you think it's a a good idea in general? Because I, we heard all these horror stories in the past of folk who who really got themselves in awful trouble mm. earlier on in the, mm. the beginning of the century. Mm -hmm. What about now? Is it, is it still like that or is there other opportunities there? There are opportunities. There, there, there always were opportunities, but I think the, the problems that you're referring to were because, with, at the risk of repeating myself, people went into these things without fully exploring mm -hmm. the upside and the downside. Um, buy to let is fine. The, the same rules apply to the decision to invest in property over the long term. I emphasise that mm -hmm. over the long term, it will probably be a good investment, and you'll probably recover your investment at the end of it, and hopefully a bit on top. Mm -hmm. But is it what you want to do? Do you want to become a property landlord? Um, being a landlord does carry with it a number of obligations, mm -hmm. um, and more so in the domestic side than, than in the, the commercial side, because very often leases of domestic property leave the repairing liability with the landlord. Oh, right, okay. So if you've inherited your, your, uh, a family house, for example, and uh, it looks like a good idea to let it out, you have to think carefully about, is it in the right place for letting? Mm -hmm. Is it this kind of <coughs> size and modernity that tenants will want? You uh, yeah, of course, I suppose people going in will want something that's, that, that they see like in, in a showroom. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. indeed. Um, People's, people's aspirations are, are, are high these days and, and, and so the kind of old fashioned idea of, of um, student flats that we may all have used in, in Glasgow and in Edinburgh or Dundee 20 years ago I mean, no heat, don't wash right. anymore with no heat <laughs> with, with no floor maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so, um, <laughs> it wasn't so, me honest I'll tell you. <laughs> But that kind of that kind of um, specification won't wash anymore. Tenants, tenants are expecting modern, efficient property, mm -hmm. and so as a landlord, you're going to have to spend some money, perhaps making your property uh, up to the up to the up to the mark. Then, assuming you get a tenant, you've got to be keeping an eye on whether they are keeping to their end of the bargains. They ain't coming in regularly. Are they looking after it in terms of cleaning and internal condition? Because mm -hmm. you have to do that, don't you? That's As the landlord, uh, you, you, have to, you have to, unless you've got an agent, and if you have an agent, then that takes a big slice of the income out. So if you're doing it yourself, you have to, you have to be aware that, that you, you will be giving yourself another job of work to do. Mm -hmm. And then there's the emotional attachment that a lot of folk have with their house, or, or their house that they inherit. You know, uh -huh. if it was your granny's house, and, and you always went to see your granny on a Wednesday afternoon, then do you really want some, do you really want the, the, are you up for having the kind of objective task of, of, of just using it as a means of income? Yeah, because that's what it is at the end that, of the day, it, isn't it's it? It's a business, it's uh -huh. a business thing you're going into and it, it's no longer a kind of family friendly, emotional, emotional deal at all. So for some folk, they can do that. For some folk, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But for, some, for other folk, they can't. And some folk, if, and I know of particular people that have made that decision that they've decided that for one reason or another, this property it means too much to me, far better just to sell it. Mm -hmm. You can use the capital somewhere else. And, and for that decision, perhaps they sell that house that has the emotional hang up for them, maybe buy a flat nice. if, if they want to buy to let for, mm -hmm. for the reasons, for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. The same funding principles apply though. And, and um, we talked about people having got into difficulty in the past. Um, assume the worst. You've always got to assume that your tenant isn't there. Mm -hmm. And if you're taking a, a chunky loan that has monthly repayments required of it, be fully aware that if your tenant, for whatever reasons he has, defaults, you're going to have to still make the mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. You can't just take a, a mortgage holiday mm -hmm. unless... And you might, you might also still be staying in your house, which, <laughs> yes. I, which you'd imagine is another set of issues altogether. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've heard some stories as to how to solve that, but it's probably not for public use. <laughs> oh, definitely not. <laughs> so um, um, so take, I, I, don't want to, I don't want this to sound like I'm just sort of steering everybody to, to go and speak to solicitors and surveyors and architects and all the rest of it, but, but they do need to take advice. They do need to take um, a, a reasonable level of advice. Mm -hmm. Um. And just, uh, I think that I know that you're primarily a, a you know, a, a commercial property specialist, but but what just as a surveyor in the in the general the domestic housing market, this ninety five percent loans that have been backed by the government, 
does this not sound a wee bit like where we were before? You know, I, it I, to me, adjust, you know, yeah. I'm a, as an accountant, I'm like, mm, but I just want to see what you think. I share your sentiment completely, Gary. I mean, I think um, the whole reason that we got into this mess in the first place was because people were borrowing too much. Mm-hmm. People were were kind of um, were the, the, the idea was planted in people's minds that they could borrow pretty much as much as they wanted. Mm-hmm. The banks weren't really monitoring that at all. They were just handing over as much as people. Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, asked for, and uh, and then lo and behold, some of the people couldn't afford to pay it back, mm-hmm. and uh, we know what happened as a result of that. And so the amount of loan um, related to your ability to pay it back is absolutely critical. Mm-hmm. Is ninety five percent too much? For some folk, it definitely is too much. Yes, mm-hmm. um, I think the government backing is a good thing. I think that I think that that was that the absence of that. For the last ten or fifteen years, has been has been a, an unnecessary um, difficulty for 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 the the institution of mortgage mortgage buying. But so, and so the return of a ninety of, of a of a government backing for a, a, a small portion of the loan is is quite a healthy thing. But ninety five percent is a, is a is a big percentage of 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 the property value, and. Um, and it, it kind of depends upon values rising. Mm-hmm. That, that's predicated in the fact that 95% now will hopefully only be 85% in another few years' time. Yes. And that's, that's a big, big assumption. Um, but just finally, what, I mean, is there any sort of, any things you would like to share with us, advice-wise, or, or things, maybe scenarios you've come across that, that were good or bad you know, that, that, that might yeah. illustrate this? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we come across quite a lot of odd Odd things that that don't seem right, and um, we're involved in a whole broad spectrum of, of, of property types in, in our firm, from domestic through all sorts of commercial property, and uh, and I, I, I never I never fail to be surprised at some of the some of the things that we come across in terms of people's naivety or people's ridiculous expectations, oh, yeah. um, and and so there are good stories and bad stories. I mean, there was there was a a foreign gentleman who expressed an interest in a property we were selling in a fairly remote part in the Highlands mm-hmm. and so he said he wanted to come up and see this from London where he was based and uh, I arranged to meet him on site and uh, and as far as he was concerned that was fine he was he was going to meet me on site so he turned up eventually about half an hour late in a taxi from Inverness to the middle of the Highlands literally mm-hmm. um, Spent about 15 minutes looking around it, and this was a big property with um, land and a river frontage and everything. This is a commercial property, right? yes. yes aye. Yeah. Uh, he spent about 15 minutes having a quick look around and said, Yeah, this was exactly what he was wanting, and now could I get him back to Inverness? His taxi had gone about five minutes before, and so he was completely relying on me giving him a lift back to Inverness. He didn't even get a return flight booked. <laughs> and um, so I had to say, Well, what's your plan for this property? And, and he I obviously can't tell you everything that went went on because it was confidential between us, but he had this wild, daft idea about how he was going to use this property. In fact, um, he was he had a particular plan for, for the river. He, he, he was going to, he thought, install a cage in the river to uh-huh. catch all the fish. <laughs> um, so I just had to kind of nod sagely and take him back to the airport. and. Uh, in fact, I couldn't take the airport, I had to take the railway station because he'd, he'd planned this so badly that he'd flown up from London, didn't have a return flight, he had to get a train from Inverness back to Edinburgh to catch the last flight back to London. So, where was he coming from? What had, what had infused this idea into his head that he could buy this property and cage put a fish. cage oh. in the river? I, so, where, I don't know, these daft ideas <laughs> come up from time to time. But we see good stories too, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I was, I was over in Sky quite recently and went to see um, people that I'd, I'd given some advice to a couple of years ago. And they'd, the Sky Bakery is is, uh, is run by a, a couple, Barry and Lisa Hawthorne. And when I met them first two or three years ago, they'd asked me to look at a, a big industrial building that they were thinking of taking on. And they had this cracking little bakery business that they were just running from their own kitchen. Mm-hmm. And so literally their own domestic kitchen was... I went in to see him and it was just chaos. You know, there was food in all sorts of stages of preparation all around the room. There was hardly any space to swing a cat. They had a bear they were bringing up. <laughs> and uh, and it, it just didn't look like a business at all. They had nice bakery, but was it a business? It, it looked a bit... A bit, a bit Highland. 
a bit Highland Aye. and a bit prone to, to, to challenges. <laughs> but I gave them the advice they wanted and, and, and that was fine. And so I was back there recently, went in to see them in their new premises and they've got an absolutely brilliant thing going. They've taken on this big shed, they've done a huge amount to it themselves mm -hmm. under a lease. Um, and they've got a, a, a fantastic production bakery going, they've got a cafe and a, an art gallery at the first floor and it's all worked out really well. They've got a cracking customer base and they're expanding their their, their sales and getting local business and tourist business. They seem to have done everything right. And so it's nice and satisfying to, to see somebody pulling that off, especially in the last few years when you could have said the economy was against them. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's a bit heartwarming. Do you ever find yourself in difficult situations? You know? I like to ask these questions of, prof of professionals. <laughs> so we have to, we we've had plugs here for uh, lawyers, uh, accountants, uh, surveyors, but is it all easy? It's, it's not all easy. I mean, one of, the, one of the, the, the best things about my job is, is the variety, and I think variety is nice in everybody's job, but it's, it's, there are lots of really depressing things about our job, but the variety is good. Um, and so we're in all sorts of property, and yeah, we find ourselves in, in tricky, uh, surprising situations from time to time. I was trapped in a basement in a, in a shop in, in Inverness, <laughs> trapped in this bloody basement. Oh, sorry, excuse my French. But I was given a key. For, well, to start the story, I was to arrange access to this place. I didn't do it locally. I had to go through the, the estates department in Glasgow, went into the property, saw the upstairs, went down to the basement, was given a key, said, this will do you fine. Went downstairs, a bit of a labyrinth downstairs. So I was plotting this plan of the basement and ended up in this little tiny passage about three feet wide by four feet long. Um, went in to shut the door behind me, had the key, it wasn't the right key. And so I was, I was stuck in this little cell um, and it was, only, it was only by luck that my mobile phone worked and I could phone the lassie in Glasgow to get her to speak to the receptionist upstairs in the shop to come and let me out. So that was a, an interesting few minutes. If I hadn't had a signal on my mobile, I might still have been there yet. But, you know, colleagues have been <laughs> stuck under floors as well and <laughs> fallen through roof spaces and all that kind of thing. My most amusing one, I suppose, was the fact that I was, was, was doing a, a, an inspection in a, in a supermarket. It wasn't in Inverness. Um, and I went in to just look at the gents' toilets just to make sure everything was there that should have been. And I went in and there's this little grubby bloke sitting in the middle of the floor <laughs> with a plastic bag counting out grimy £5 notes and, and the little piles on the floor. So I just kind of gently stepped around him and did what I had to do. I don't think he even realised it was there. And as I stepped back to come out again, I accidentally just set off the hand dryer. Oh. <laughs> I think you're kind of getting the picture, but it was this snowstorm of five pound notes. And I just crept quietly out of the room again and left him trying to catch them all over the place. So yeah, we, we have our moments. I think, I think that's a great moment to leave it on. And dare I say it, I have to say it, Jeff Collins, Ally Severe Scotland, shows you how to blow your money in property. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> Listen, Jeff, thank you very much. That was that's absolutely sorry. superb.